Well, the common theme in all forms of universalism is that everybody ultimately is going to be saved. Universalism comes in a few different flavors. There is what might be so-called Christian universalism, which grounds this universal salvation in something that Christ did or, or was, perhaps his atoning work, however they conceive it. Uh, that would be people like John A.T. Robinson. Uh, but then we have uh, other forms of universalism, which we might call pluralistic universalism, which, uh, like John Hick, everybody ultimately is going to be saved, but uh, people can get there through a variety of paths. So Hindus can achieve this salvation through their religion. Christians, yeah, if, you, if Jesus is the way you get there, then that's fine too. And, and so there's all these different paths that lead to universal salvation. But again, uh, what they all have in common is that everybody in the end is going to make it to glory in some way. Now, as to the question, is it biblical? No. <laughs> but um, the point is, is that if eternal conscious punishment is true, and it is true, it's strongly attested in the Bible. Jesus spoke about the doctrine more than anybody else. His apostles spoke a great deal about the doctrine. The Old Testament uh, is very clear on the doctrine. So if the doctrine of eternal conscious punishment is a biblical doctrine, and granting that the Bible is the word of God and therefore true, then by the nature of the case, uh, universalism can't be true. It's, it's, it's in direct contradiction to the doctrine of eternal conscious punishment. Now, I'm fully aware that uh, universalists have biblical passages that they attempt to construe as universalist friendly. Um, it just doesn't work. When you look at the, the text, you cannot make a plausible case for universalism exegetically. And obviously I have to just stipulate that since I don't have time to prove it. I've written on this and many other people have, have written on this over the centuries. But it, it's, it's just not a winning case that you can make if you are willing to look at the whole counsel of God. But what I would like to say is what I think is the real method by which universalists arrive at this conclusion. I don't think universalists uh, come up with the doctrine that everybody will be saved by starting out with kind of a, an open-minded blank slate, read the entire scripture, look at the whole counsel of God, and then determine from that, you know, the, the biblical evidence here leads me to universalism. I don't think that's what happens. I think what they do, which is quite similar to what other deni deniers of hell, such as uh, annihilationists, for instance, there's a number of ways you can deny hell besides universalism. I think, I think their method is, is uh, similar. And what they do is they start with a premise, with a thesis, and it could even be a true premise as far as it goes. And then what they do is deduce from that what they think is compatible or incompatible with that starting point, and then that becomes their doctrine. So, in the case of universalism, typically what they do is they start with the idea that God is love. Now, that's all well and good. That's true enough. Uh, God, is, uh, God is a God of love. More than that, God is love. I mean, the Bible states the love of God in emphatic terms. So, so they're right in that point, and that's not in dispute between us. But then what they do is they assume that granting that God is love, they deduce from that what in their mind is compatible or not compatible with God being a God of love. And to their mind, there's no way that a God who would, as, as they would put it, send people to an eternal hell, there's no way in their mind that that could be compatible with a God of love. Now, that's not the right way to do theology generally, not if we're going to be faithful to the Bible. What we need to do, whether it's this question or any other question, is we look at the whole of Scripture, the entirety of the Bible, we determine uh, what you might call the facts on the ground. And so in this case, on this question, the facts on the ground are, number one, God is a God of love, and number two, 
eternal conscious punishment is true. It's an equal fact. It's, it's just as much a fact as the fact that God is a God of love. And so that being the case, that's what we must affirm because that's what God says. Now, having done that, then we can work to harmonize seeming or apparent discrepancies, problems, questions that may arise as to how these truths uh, integrate harmoniously. And we know that they do because God is a God of order and, and uh, he doesn't contradict himself. So it's not up to us to decide which facts to enter into evidence. God's the one who enters the facts into evidence from his word. We can then, though, look at those facts and try to figure out how they interrelate. And we can see what the Bible itself says about how love and justice, mercy and peace, kiss, how they are compatible. Uh, we can develop models for explaining this. But at the end of the day, whether we can explain it to our satisfaction or not, and on this question, by the way, I think it, there are good, solid ways of reconciling these. I don't think it's a problem myself. But whether a person accepts my solution to the problem or somebody else's solution to the problem or just simply says, I don't know the solution to the problem, nevertheless, God is a God of love and eternal conscious punishment is true. And that's what we have to go with, whether it's on this or any other question in theology. 